Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I think this mic needs to be fixed. This mic is too humble. <laughs> so that's better. Yeah, thank you. To give it some self respect. <laughs> so, one of the oldest themes in literature across the, the world is the conflict between good and evil. And especially the triumph of good over evil, of virtue over vice. Now, I'll talk about one such ancient story which addresses this theme in very vivid, dramatic terms. The Ramayana is a book that has, I think, the Ramayana is a book that has actually captivated billions of people for millennia. And I will talk about this primarily in three parts. One is, I'll talk about the, what do we mean by good and evil, or virtue and vice. And then, uh, what does the Ramayana talk about this? And how, what does the Ramayana story tell? And then eventually we'll talk about how this applies in our life. So let's start with the question. How many of you feel that people are basically good? Okay. How many of you feel that people are basically bad? <laughs> mm, some of us, yeah. Okay, let me nuance the question. Do you feel that some people are basically bad? Some people? Actually, it's true, thank you. We would deeply like to believe that people are basically good. But when we conduct ourselves in life, we do see that people sometimes act in terrible ways. They sometimes hurt us, they sometimes betray us. And if we are too naive, thinking that everyone is good, we will be shattered, we will be exploited, we will be abused. But at the same time, if we become cynical, thinking that everyone is bad, then we will end up with loneliness. I saw a car bumper. It said, the more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we have bad experiences with people, we might start thinking people, all people are bad. Now, the, the Dharmic traditions of India say that actually, when you want to talk about people's basic nature, we all are complex living beings. And our existence is multidimensional. Multidimensional means we have our physical shell, that's our body, then we have our mind. And beyond that is our spiritual essence, our soul. That's what we are at our core. So, in this three level, body, mind and soul. At the level of body, all of us are human beings. At the level of the mind, each one of us has different desires, impressions, conceptions stored. And we as spiritual beings are on a multi-life journey. So therefore, we often get impressions from previous lives into this life. Now, many of you may be parents and you have children. Each child, even if both children have, you have two, three children, all children have come from the same parents. But each child is individual, different. Even if the children are twins, and even if they are identical twins, still they are individually different. Their personality is different. So we are, so the impressions in our mind are shaped by what they come from our previous lives. They are also shaped by our upbringing. They are also shaped by our association. So basically these three factors, past life, upbringing and association, they broadly affect the kind of impressions we have in our mind. And if somebody has repeatedly done bad things, then they get habituated to doing bad. 
and then after some time they may even delight in doing that so suppose we are going along a crowded road and we accidentally step on someone's foot if you realize it is oh i'm sorry we'll apologize but imagine somebody steps on somebody's foot and they notice they have stepped and then they deliberately left lift their shoe and bang it on their face what cool thing is that so uh, when we talk about evil evil essentially means to cause suffering for the sake of causing suffering sometimes this is the way like things are in the world suffering is an avoid if i'm going in a crowded road i might just step on someone's foot because it's so crowded i can't avoid it that's an avoid sometimes suffering is essential as when a doctor gives an injection a doctor does surgery some pain is essential but it serves some purpose but when suffering is caused simply for the sake of causing suffering that is evil so now that's a very broad definition of evil but evil does exist there are some people who are sadistic they just delight in causing pain to others so now why are some people like this because the impressions within them are like that they have very dark impression which impel them to do dark things and not only they impel them they give in to those impulses and they keep doing dark things so it can be because of anger it can be because of greed it can be because of lust i had a friend in russia he told me that during the communist days there was like a, a, a satirical cartoon which was propagated in in csr it said that the news says that the price of vodka has risen so then a child asks his father dad now will you drink less because the price has gone up and the father says no you will eat less so now somebody can get so hooked on to something that just to gratify their craving for alcohol they may deprive their children of food so sometimes our vices within us might take so much control may dominate us so much that we can become desensitized to those around us so now within vice is virtue but and within vice we can have two distinct categories so i talk about a different between virtue and vice so is there something like this yes we could say if somebody is causing pain to others that's vice but within vice also we could have two distinct categories one is weakness and the other is wickedness weakness is where someone sometimes succumbs to lust succumbs to anger succumbs to greed and they end up doing something which is which is hurtful to others which is unethical but then afterward they regret it say i want to give this up i will not do this again they may not succeed immediately in stopping it but they do try to do it there is at least some remorse i should not have done this but in wickedness there is no remorse when somebody is wicked they not only do bad but they don't even feel bad on doing bad rather they feel just see how clever i am i can do this and i can get away with it so in in people who are with weakness their conscience is still there and their conscience makes them come back to the right path or at least makes them aware you are on the wrong path but in wickedness the consciousness has been numbed and dumb conscience not consciousness conscience has been numbed and dumb our conscience is like our inner compass so now in general whenever somebody succumbs to weakness they need to be helped weakness needs to be forgiven when weakness is reciprocated with kindness with forgiveness and gradually weakness can rise to good weakness can be trans- overcome and the person can rise to goodness but when somebody has wickedness then forgiveness for wickedness is foolishness because that person has no desire to change 
So if they do something wrong, and if sometimes the, the sometimes somebody does something wrong, and we protect them from the consequences of their actions, because we feel they are not bad people. But sometimes the consequences are the only way somebody can learn. So if when there is wickedness, there has to be not forgiveness but justice, not revenge but justice. So. When we talk about vice, virtue and vice, vice can either be weakness or it can be wickedness. And we will look at this with this broad framework that if you consider as goodness, weakness, wickedness. And above them is the supreme embodiment of goodness that is God. So if weakness associates with goodness, then the, those with weakness, if they associate with those who are devoted to God, those they connect with God, then they can overcome their weakness and come toward goodness. But if weakness associates with wickedness, then they will be dragged down. So with this background, let's look at, so this is the, the, the conceptual background. After that, let's look at the story of the Ramayana. The Ramayana is an ancient epic, which is not just ancient, but also timeless. It demonstrates timeless principles through its characters. So the, the Bhagavad Gita, which is the ancient yoga text, explains that there are multiple levels of existence. We live currently at the material level. And beyond this is a spiritual level of reality. And sometimes from that spiritual level, the divine descends to this level of reality. And that descent is called as avatar. Now, of course, in today's world, because of the movie avatar and because of online, people have a different idea. This is my avatar on this particular site or on this particular video game or whatever. The avatar has the idea, of it, but still there's a, there's a similarity that avatar has the idea of crossing over. But I'm in the physical realm and in the digital realm, this is my avatar. So this is, so, so the, our concept of avatar is crossing over from the spiritual level of reality to the material level of reality. So when millennia ago, Ram, who is a manifestation of the divine, descended to the world. And he descended because at that time, there were many demoniac forces who were exploiting, abusing, murdering, and making the earth into hell. And at that time, Ram was a very virtuous and powerful ruler. He protected the earth from the demons. But at one particular point, the most powerful among the demons was named Ravan. Now the word Ravan itself signifies wickedness. Because Ravan means one who makes others cry. There are, some, there are two kinds of people. Some people bring happiness wherever they go. And some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ravana was like that in the second category. Wherever he would go, people would start crying. He was such a horrible person. Whenever people he would go away, People would heave a sigh of relief. Of course, they could heave a sigh of relief if he kept them alive. Hmm. Very brutal. And eventually, he he was also, so generally, whenever somebody has power, it power very easily goes to the head. And once the power goes to the head, one starts thinking that everything should dance to my team. That everything is for my pleasure, for my enjoyment. So Ram had a, had a beautiful queen, a consort, Sita. And Ravan, through a vicious conspiracy, abducted Sita. And then Ram had to make a great effort to recover her. At that time, Ram had no army. He was in the. He was for a period of 
few years living in the forest at that time as a mendicant although he was a powerful prince so he had no army and he just formed an army of of a species called vanara vanara means nara is human vanara is are they human that is they were they were these were ape like beings but they were they had some simian and some human characteristics and then they decided to march to the kingdom of lanka which is the kingdom of ravan and ram tried his best to resolve things and keep nowadays we are very apprehensive whenever somebody talks about whenever violence is associated with religion because we have the specter of terrorism now if we look at the ancient epics the war was always fought according to serious war codes which were considered inviolable and the basic principle in the war code was that no civilians are to be attacked broadly we can say that even in the ramayana although ravana was the demon we see when the war was fought he was demoniac the war was fought according to war codes what are they basically no attacking civilians one warrior will only attack another warrior and even the other warrior is to be attacked only when that warrior is equipped and that warrior is alert so it is like let's let's have a test of our skills let's have a skill, test of our strength now if you see today what is done in the name of religion terrorism is exactly the opposite all three characteristics you know it is they attack only civilians usually and those who are having no weapons and those who are having they're not alert this catch people unaware so this is brutal this is wicked but the point is that there are times when strong action is required and ram tried his best he said i don't want a war with you ravan he just returns it and ravan he not only had power he had lust he had great arrogance and he said i'm not going to return and he was very insolent very arrogant very insolent even his own elders advised him but he never did listen to them now he had kept sita in confinement he had he had received a curse because he had violated many women in the past he had been cursed that if he ever took a woman against her will he would die that's why he had not uh, violated sita he had kept and sita she had refused to even end sita as the consort of ram she said i will not even enter into your palace so he had kept her in a forest she said sita was so devoted to her uh, to ram she said that as long as ram is living in the forest i will also live in the forest so he kept her in a garden and now he couldn't have his way with her but that didn't stop him from using demoniac means and that was he surrounded sita with hideous demonesses and they would constantly threaten her taunt her and scare her and she was all alone if we are all alone that's that's difficult but if we are alone in trying to live in a particular way and everyone else is discouraging us everyone else is criticizing us everyone else is threatening us it becomes very difficult to continue uh, to do what we are doing i suppose see for right now i am speaking and if i speak something say every one of you start glaring at me not just staring but glaring at me and i'll start thinking you guys speak something wrong what's happening isn't it so we are very social creatures and if the people around us disapprove us in some way then it affects us mm-hmm. i travel across the world in most 8 7 8 months i'm traveling but there's one city where i go whenever i give talks there is one person 
who comes and sits right in the front like you are sitting and sitting in the front just glares at me throughout the class <laughs> now the only way I can give a talk is not look at that person <laughs> so the point I am making is if everybody is disapproving us everybody is criticizing us it is very difficult to stick to our principles stick to our course of action for that if we are to stick we need to do one thing we shouldn't overvalue those who devalue us if one person is just glaring at me I can't overvalue that one person and we should value those who value us that way we can maintain our stability even among people who are critical to us so although Sita was surrounded by all these demonesses and they were scaring her, threatening her she remained firm how she didn't overvalue their opinions and she in her heart she remembered her Lord Ram she remembered her family there she remembered her friends and she was thinking what will please them what will displease them what is the right thing to do and eventually although Ravan tried various means to try to threaten and scare Sita Sita was unaffected and the war eventually unfolded. When the war unfolded, it was, a, it was a terrible war. But one after another after another, Ravan and his forces were destroyed. And Ravan tried to use many uh, nefarious, tricky means to try to bring down Ram's forces. But somehow Ram's forces survived all of them. And here also, sometimes a great person's greatness is seen not just in the great things that they do, but also in how they do small things. So now if, if the, if the war was fought according to war codes and the idea was that during the day they would fight and during the night they would desist. So Ravan gave orders to his soldiers that now this Ravan's kingdom was an island surrounded by an ocean. So he said, all my soldiers, all the demons on my side who die, at night, you should go and toss their bodies into the ocean. As far away as possible. Why? He said, the next morning, when the enemy soldiers come, they will see there are no corpses here. And they will become discouraged. Thinking that we did not cause any casualties with others. So he had literally an attitude of use and throw. <laughs> so that's now some, we have some people have we have use and throw commodities now. now. That's sometimes very detrimental to the environment. Because if it's just one time use, it just pollutes the environment. In the oceans, there is a great garbage patch. It's like males and males of garbage. Which is there in the... Is the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean? Pacific. Pacific Ocean, yeah. The great, uh, great Pacific Ocean. So, use and throw things out. Now, we may do it with things, but Ravan would do it with people. Get them to fight for him and throw them away. Physically. So, such a inhumane attitude. On the other hand, every night, Ram would stay awake late in the night and personally offer perform the last rites of all those who had been martyred for his cause. And eventually, as the war went on, slowly but surely, uh, Ram started gaining the upper hand. And then, <coughs> the final war began. Now, Ravan is described that he is He's a historical character who existed long ago, but it's also described that he represents vice, especially the vice of lust. Lust is not just sexual desire. Lust is generally any desire that goes to a self-destructive degree. Desire is a natural within us. We all want to grow. 
we all want to we all very unicellular organisms at one time but we've grown now millions and millions of cells in our body that's growth is natural so similarly we all want to grow socially we want to grow financially we want to grow intellectually we all want to grow the growth is natural but cancer is also growth however cancer is growth that is destructive because it is disproportionate one set of cells start growing so much that they their growth starts destroying the whole body similarly for us we all have desires and to be conscious is to be desirous but sometimes desires can start growing disproportionately and they become destructive desires become like cancer so ravan represents a cancerous overgrowth of lust where he had he knew no secret boundaries and he wanted whatever he wanted however he wanted whenever he wanted that was his idea so when the final war took place at that time bahan ram and ravan were fighting so ram shot many arrows now arrows can be shot at various part of the body at the body so ram ravan would shoot ram would shoot arrows at the head of ram but ravan had some mythical mystical powers by which he, he would not be killed by the arrow that would hit his head and went on and on and on even if a head would fall off it would come back again. head would fall off it would come back again. head would fall off it would come back again. and then finally ram was told by one of his wise associates that you shoot not at the head but at the heart at the heart and then ram shot arrow which is straight into the heart and when it went into the heart it just pierced ravan through the heart and he fell life leaving his body when he left when his soul left his body he gave a roar that shook the earth and that day when ram won that great war over ravan that day historically the anniversary of that is tomorrow that is called ram vijay utsav the victory the celebration on the victory of ram or it's called also dasera now in india on this occasion there are giant effigies of this ravan made and then there are, there are people who come together and they there's a big bow from which the arrow is shot and his flying flaming arrow goes and hits the effigy of ravan and then the whole effigy catches fire and what it symbolizes is that we pray for purity it this symbolizes that just as the vicious ravan was overcome by ram similarly whatever vices are there in our heart they may also be overcome by the potency of ram that the potency of ram also manifests as his names so we are all already in the kirtan of the hari krishna mantra in which also we have the name of ram so when we chant these mantras it is like arrows are going into our heart and the vices that are there within they are getting weakened they are getting destroyed it's it's significant that as long as the arrows were hitting the head they were just the heads were regrowing but when the arrow pierced the heart it was over so what that signifies is that we cannot overcome desire simply by removing the visible manifestations of the desire visible manifestations means if i just say okay i have something some bad habit which i don't want to do but i keep doing it and i resolve i will not do it ever again well that intention is good but desires keep surfacing keep surfacing again and again and again it's desires seem to be incredibly just like we have the hiv virus no matter how many times we try to destroy it it somehow resurfaces so many of our lower desires are like that 
So there, many of us make New Year resolutions. So I was once invited for a talk show, a radio talk show on uh, New Year resolutions. So I had done some research. So it seems almost 80% of the New Year resolutions that people make, the, the resolutions they make on New Year are not new. <laughs> you made the resolution the previous year, it stayed for some time and then it went off. So what happens is that when we try to attack desire, it doesn't work. Because the desires are too resilient, they just keep coming back again and again. So when Ram hit the arrow at the heart, what that signifies is that we don't just try to change or control our desires. We change our heart. Change our heart means change our conception of what is desirable. That comes by spiritual education. That comes by spiritual purification. So as so when we're trying to control desire, that means what? Yeah, this is good, but I'm not meant to do this. Now we may say, yeah, I know it's not good, but we may say it, it's harmful for me. We might verbally say it, but inside us, we don't believe it. So the real way to deal with desires is not simply to try to control them externally. Yes, sometimes some amount of control is essential. But the cure is not just control. The cure is change of heart. And the changing our conception, changing our definition of happiness, that is what is done by the spiritual practice of Bhakti Yoga. So when Ram shot an arrow at the heart of Ravan, what it signifies is that that similar arrow when it goes to the heart, our heart can become pure. See, we all, I earlier talked about impressions in our mind. We all have different impressions. So suppose we have a, a robot which was programmed that if you show it red light and it says it is blue light. Now, no matter how many times we show, we tell it is red light, and it, and it will always call, call it as blue. Just showing it more red light again and again is not going to change. To change the programming. So similarly for us, if if we, see, we have all been programmed in a certain way that we have certain programmed definitions of happiness. And one, as long as we have those definitions, this is enjoyable. And then somebody said, oh, don't do it. Okay, I'll not do it. But then, because our definition is this is enjoyable, but I should not do it. Why should I not do it? And then sometimes some opportunity will come and we'll succumb. So what we need to do is change the programming. All of us can look back in our lives. We all have certain definitions of happiness. Now we may have achieved some of those things. We may not have achieved some of those things. But did that really make us happy? So the whole process of Bhakti Yoga is about changing the programming which makes us function. Now in the case of Ravan, there are some people who are just not ready to change their programming. We can say everybody is changeable, but maybe not in this life. So Ravan was in that sense incorrigible. And that's why he had to be punished. But even amid this punishment, generally, if one army wins over the other army, then often there is brutal vandalization of the defeated kingdom. All the wealth is plundered, everybody who can be victimized and violated and enslaved, all kinds of war crimes happen. Mm -hmm. But in this case, absolutely nothing happened. And eventually, Ram had a faithful and devoted assistant, Hanuman. Ram sent Hanuman to Sita. Sita had still been captivated. And as I said, no civilians were attacked, so she was away. And Hanuman was sent with a message that Ram has won and see Ram would like to see you soon. He was trying to send a message. Now Hanuman had come earlier there once to meet Sita. And he had seen how all the evilnesses around were threatening and tormenting. So at that time, 
when ram when hanuman told sita that ram has won ravan is out of the ravan is now eliminated and you will soon be reunited with ram sita was jubilant and then at that time hanuman was hanuman was happy to see her happiness but then he said you know all these demonesses they threatened and tormented you for so long so for a whole sita was almost for a year in the prison in prison with that for in that guard park he said that i want to give all of them a sound thrashing they threatened and tormented you so much and sita looked at anuman and she said that they meant no malice they had no malice in that they were simply doing what their master ravana told them he said there's no need she said there's no need to punish them he said that now i am just happy that nobody is stopping me from uniting with ram again and she gives quite a discourse on forgiveness over there and she says that those who are virtuous they forgive the wrong doings of others even if the wrongs have been done to them still they forgive and hanuman hears this and is amazed somebody who suffered so much for her to forgive so so easily is amazed as you are a saintly lady so now here is a very significant point which will bring like a, my starting and the story to a circular conclusion that ravan couldn't be given forgiveness but the demonesses were given forgiveness sometimes we ask is sometimes we we say forgiveness is good forgive people yes we should forgive definitely but forgiveness is a virtue and beautifulness is also a virtue forgiveness is a virtue and beautifulness is also a virtue so if if we want if society is to be made social order is to be maintained then everybody has to do their duty and if somebody obstructs somebody else's duty then social order will crumble so if a doctor misdiagnoses some disease and sometimes gives a wrong prescription then overall if the doctor has always been treating patients well carefully then one incidental oversight can be overlooked but if some doctor is deliberately complicate the disease of the patient so that a doctor say that so that they can keep getting more and more bills from them and if they deliberately hurt someone then that cannot be forgiven so everybody has to do their duty so ravan was obstructing sita in doing her duty to ram ravan was disrupting the citizens of the world from living life virtuously so the, the demoness is they were simply opening up so when somebody is disrupting social order strong action has to be taken against them. but there is no there is even when there is justice there is a difference between justice and vindictiveness justice is done not so much because you did this to me so i will do this to you rather you did this to me and if you do not get consequences then you will keep doing this to others and others will also start doing the same thing so for the sake of maintaining order in society justice is required it's essential but vindictiveness is that you did this to me and i do this to you when people are vindictive they when they are revengeful or vindictive they basically become obsessed with the other person and their whole sense of self existence and their purpose of their existence 
become centered on causing pain to those who have caused pain to them. And that is a very negative way to live. So Ram as a virtuous king had to punish those who were vicious. And he did that to Ravana. But Sita in her virtuous nature, she saw that they are no longer a threat to me. So she forgave. Let them go. So we see this dynamism that apply that is demonstrated in the Ramayana. So the victory was not just that Ram defeated Ravana. That, that's glorious. Good triumph over evil. But the victory is also that Sita never became bitter. Sita never became vindictive. That sometimes what happens is when good tries to overcome evil, good may overcome evil, but in the process, good itself becomes evil. Sometimes when we, deal, when we are dealing with bitter people, when we are dealing with bad people, and then just trying to deal with them also makes us hard-hearted, makes us harsh, makes us... Uh, it contaminates us. So ultimately, for all of us, the virtue of... We all have, as I said, we have at our level of soul, every one of us is pure, every one of us is godly. Every one of us has a potential for virtue and godliness. But at the level of the mind, all of us have different impressions. And some impressions are good and some are not so good. So we need to rise from... So the, this potential for virtue has to overcome the propensity for vice that is there within us. It could be a propensity for weakness or it could be a propensity for wickedness. This potential for virtue has to rise. So I asked, is everyone innately good? Yes, at the level of soul, everyone is innately good. But at the level of the mind, everyone, what is their innate quality? It is seen through their actions. Now the process of Bhakti Yoga is a process by which the godliness, the soul becomes activated. The godliness starts becoming manifested. And whether it is weakness or wickedness, both can be overcome. Both can be purified. So all the Ramayana is a book of great, is a story of great drama, action, conspiracy, romance. Everything that is there in a thriller movie or thriller novel is there in the Ramayana. But beyond it all, it is a demonstration of the potency of, of, potency of divinity uplift humanity so that our divinity starts manifesting. Our godliness and our virtue starts manifesting. And that is what inspired the pure, millions for millennia. The purifying potency of the Ramayana is what has attracted people throughout history, especially in the Dharmic traditions in India as well as the Indian subcontinent. Or now, that, that core message that we all have the potential for, the, for virtue, for godliness, for goodness within us. And we all can bring out that virtue. And we all can become better human beings. And we all can light the world. The light of divinity wants to shine through each one of us. And to the extent we let the propensity for wise within us control us, then we don't let that light of divinity come through. And to that extent, our heart and our life remains darker. And not just our heart and our life, but our world remains darker. But if we connect with the divine through the practice of Bhakti Yoga, and then those impurities start getting removed. And then the light of divinity starts manifesting through us, through each one of us. Now, if we can pull our act together, if we can overcome our propensities toward weakness and wickedness, then each one of us can do so much more good. Each one of us can become so much better. And how much good we can do? That even we don't know. Because God can manifest through us. God can use us as instruments for doing good in the world. 
and discover if just by pulling our act together discovering how much good we can do that is life's ultimate adventure not just climbing up some mountains or going skiing or going uh, any kind of adventure sports it's fine but discovering how much good we can do if we bring out the goodness within us that is life's ultimate adventure and the triumph of good over evil which the ramayana and the ram vijay also demonstrates is a call for such an adventure for every one of us to discover how good we can become and how much good we can manifest in the world by manifesting our godliness from within so i'll summarize what i spoke i spoke today on the theme of <clears throat> the significance of the ram vijay also i started by first talking about a common motif throughout history has been that the battle between good and evil and we talk about good and evil in some more subtler terms that every one of us at our at the level of soul is good at the level of mind we have different impressions and the impressions can be of some goodness or can be of vice vice has two categories weakness and wickedness the weakness is where a person does wrong but their conscience tells them it's wrong and they try to overcome it wickedness is their conscience is dead so weakness deserves forgiveness wickedness deserves consequences deserves justice so then this theme i should talk about how it is demonstrated in the ramayan now ram <coughs> his wife his queen was abducted by ravan and ram tried by every possible peaceful way to resolve but ravan was arrogant and adamant and eventually a confrontation was unavoidable but even in that confrontation ram did not lose his compassion ravan had a use and throw attitude toward his soldiers throwing them tossing them into the ocean so that the enemies would notice how we wouldn't be encouraged by thinking how many casualties there on the opposite side but ram personally prayed every night for his uh, for his soldiers for the performing their last rites and eventually in the final battle between ram and ravan ram ravan was not killed by the attack on his heads it was by the attack on his heart so his ravan's head represents our various desires our ungodly desires our low desires just by trying to control those desires i will not do this that doesn't work we need to go to the heart change the heart means change our conception of what is pleasure and that change of conception happens through spiritual education and spiritual purification which is done through bhakti yoga so ram ram's arrows going to ravana's heart is similar to the names of ram going to our heart and they will remove the vice the weakness and wickedness within our heart now the triumph of ram over ravan is not just a soul victory when hanuman wanted to punish those who had tormented sita ram said ram sita said no and she did not become vindictive although she lived among the evil and she underwent great suffering she did not become vindictive and that was also a triumph of good over evil the association with evil did not make good evil so for all of us wherever we are in life if we can bring out the potential for virtue within us and we can overcome the propensity for vice that is there within us we all can become much better than what we are the light of divinity can shine through us and make the world brighter and discovering how much good we can do in the world if we connect with god that discovery is life's ultimate adventure and the ram ram's triumph over ravan invites us all to join in that ultimate adventure of life thank you very much